They plated it in six months. As spring hinted at an early arrival, number 400 was beginning to look like an ocean liner. And beside it, number 401, fully framed and ready for plating, was also on schedule. At some point, perhaps it was when the walls of steel ran unbroken the length of four city blocks from bow to stern, perhaps when dignitaries and reporters started coming to the shipyard to see the floating palaces rising against the Belfast skyline, Andrews noticed that the men were referring to the ships by name instead of hull number. He asked the carpenters to build signs the size of barn doors and had them hung on the scaffolding at the bows. White Star Royal Mail Steamer Olympic. White Star Royal Mail Steamer Titanic. Andrews began plating Titanic on April 6, 1910. But the steel had been arriving from the Clyde for weeks. The plater's shed was an around-the-clock hive. Many of the men who worked in it were deaf. Some, because they had lived with the cacophony of the steel punches for too many years. Some, because they had been born deaf and had found the perfect place to work. The plater's shed covered an acre on the west side of the yard and had its own dock along the river. With a 40-foot high trust ceiling, it was lit by skylights in the daytime and electric bulbs at night. The noise never stopped. The men used hand signals to communicate, but no shout of alarm was loud enough if a plate or beam got loose on the end of a hoist chain. Of the hundreds of injuries and deaths in the shipyard each year, most came while manhandling steel. At the end of April 1910, when the first three tiers of plates shaped Titanic's bow, Comet Halley appeared in the night sky over Belfast. Comet hysteria was rampant, since another of the visitors from space, known as the Great Daylight Comet, had put in a sensational appearance in January that same year. The difference with Halley's, the newspapers reported, was that the Earth was going to pass through its tail, which they said was made of poisonous cyanide gas. The end of the world was a possibility. At the shipyard, a rumor circulated among the men that somehow the two gigantic ships they were building had something to do with throwing the universe off kilter, triggering divine retribution. Andrews did not believe that the world would end. He was not ordinarily a superstitious man, but he felt the comet was a good omen, a fitting cosmic tribute to the ships that were coming along so well. Carlyle retired during the summer of Comet Halley, leaving Andrews to finish the ships on his own. He hit two marks perfectly when he finished plating Titanic on October 19, 1910, and the next day launched Olympic into the River Logan. Even the launching of Oceanic in 1899, hailed as the most extravagant launching in the history of Harland and Wolfe, could not compare with the party Perry threw for Olympic. An unusually warm autumn was fending off the arrival of winter, and the launch day dawned bright and sunny. Perry arrived early, dressed in his customary launch day tweed suit, topped off with his lucky yachting cap, and squired Lady Perry around to greet their guests. A special train from Dublin pulled into the Great Northern Railway Terminal, and its passengers joined a steady stream of cars and horse carriages flowing to the shipyard. The turbine steamer Duke of Cumberland arrived, bringing Bruce and Florence Ismay, the White Star executives, their wives, and a hundred English and American reporters. J.P. Morgan was ill and sent his regrets. Every other member of the Board of International Mercantile Marine was in Belfast to celebrate the launching of the ship that might put the combine on its feet for the first time. Perry assembled his personal guests in Market Square just after 10 o'clock and led them around his shipyard on special planked walkways. The 200 lords, ladies, and dignitaries walked two abreast through the plater's shed, past the slipways, and through the machine shop, mass shed, and molding loft. At the end of the tour, near the river at the stern of the ship, Peary seated them in a grandstand draped with crimson and white banners. The hulls of White Star ships had been dark gray for 50 years. Peary and Ismay thought white would look better in photographs, so they'd had Andrews paint Olympic white for the launching. Next to Titanic's unpainted sooty black plates, Olympic gleamed in the sunlight. The white paint made the ship look even bigger than it was.
and the deep red bottom paint gave it a finished appearance, though months of work in the shipyard lay ahead before its maiden voyage. At 10.50, two rockets hissed into the sky and blossomed red over the river to warn ships and boats to steer clear of the launchway. At 11 o'clock, a third rocket exploded to signal that the launch was imminent. In the crimson and white grandstand, Peary shouted, Now! Olympic moved. By the time its entire length was in the water 62 seconds later, the ship was going 12 and a half knots. In another 40 seconds, six anchors connected to the ship by eight-inch wire hawsers stopped it dead in the water. The sounds of applause, horns, bells, and the shipyard whistles went on for five minutes. As five tugboats that looked like toys beside the giant ship nudged Olympic upriver to the outfitting wharf. Seven months and nine days later, Olympic was ready for sea trials. Perry had spent most of his time in Belfast during the last two months of fitting out, and could not have been happier with the way his nephew had handled the job. On April 1st, right on time, Andrews dry docked the ship to put on its propellers. A gang of 2,000 men gave it a fresh coat of paint, this time black for the hull, with a white superstructure and yellow trim. On May 27th, a collier delivered 3,000 tons of coal, enough for Olympics two-day sea trials and the run to Liverpool and Southampton. The following morning, a crew of 250 officers, firemen, and able-bodied seamen, under the command of White Star's senior captain, Edward John Smith, boarded the ship. Andrews and Wilding set up shop aboard Olympic with 200 Harland and Wolf designers, carpenters, and engineers to check and record every detail about the performance of the ship. While Captain Smith ran at half speed on the first day of the sea trials, Andrews roamed around Olympic from bow to stern on every deck, feeling the life in the ship he had built. He lingered for the better part of the first morning in the stupendous cavern of the engine room hashing out his misgivings about so large an open space on so large a ship. On the boat deck, he noted that the 16 lifeboats slung beneath the davits left plenty of space for the first and second class promenades. In the wireless room, he sent telegrams to Peary and Ismay, telling them that Olympic was exceeding even his wildest expectations. On the second day of sea trials, Olympic made a sweeping turn off the Irish coast to head back to Belfast. Andrews asked Captain Smith to bring the ship up to cruising speed and hold it there for at least an hour. Andrews stepped out of the wheelhouse onto the bridge wing to enjoy the wind in his face. He felt the ship shudder as it picked up speed, a distinct shivering in the yellow pine deck beneath his feet that increased as Smith brought Olympic to its cruising speed of 24 knots for the first time. Andrews looked over the railing at the froth of the bow wave in the light chop, his eyes swept down past the white superstructure to the dark sides of the hull. For a long minute, Andrews watched the steel that formed the starboard side of Olympic moving in and out. Not much, maybe two inches, three inches. But it was definitely moving in and out. He turned, walked calmly through the wheelhouse, and continued out to the port rail. Andrews looked down. Same thing. Maybe it was just that he had never before looked at the sides of so big a ship. From the bridge to the stern was a distance of three city blocks. Each side of the hull was covered by an acre and a half of steel. Andrews knew that the whole ship was flexing. He had designed it to flex. But should the sides be panting? Andrews took out his notebook and wrote, Sides panting at cruising speed. Olympic finished its sea trials and would sail on time in May 1911. Titanic was ready for launching. International Mercantile Marine, however, was in a shambles. J.P. Morgan had become a symbol of everything that could go wrong when too much wealth was in the hands of too few men. The New York Times quoted a senator's description of Morgan as a beefy, red-faced, thick-necked financial bully, drunk with wealth and power who balls his orders to stock markets, directors, courts, governments, and nations. An editorial cartoon depicted Morgan devouring buildings, ships, and steel mills in one panel, and belching grotesquely in another. 
Morgan took it all personally. He suffered from sleeplessness, depression, high blood pressure, rotting teeth, and the other infirmities of a man over 70 years old. His health was not improved by his reading accounts of his greatest blunder, International Mercantile Marine, in the same newspapers that were celebrating Cunard's brilliant new ships. Morgan juggled cash, bonds, and loans to keep IMM afloat, but the combine was running deeply in the red. While Morgan, Ismay, International Mercantile Marine, and White Star were enduring the worst of times, Harland and Wolf had never been stronger. Peary poured money into the shipyard, replacing the decrepit main office with a three-story brick building, including a new suite for himself, and completed improvements to the sheds and slipways. He fattened his order book by buying control of the Union Castle Mail Steamship Company with its 44 ships. All repair work and new construction for Union Castle would come to Harland and Wolf. With Olympic, Titanic, and a dozen other ships in the works, the Belfast Yard was already running at capacity. To handle the overflow, Peary bought majority shares in two shipyards on the Clyde River. He also bought the White Star Maintenance Yard in Southampton and was negotiating with Ismay for his repair docks in Liverpool. After Olympic's sea trials, Andrews left the ship at the deep water dock and went to Peary's office. With a board of trade surveyors standing by to sign the seaworthiness certificates and Ismay there to formally accept delivery, Andrews told Peary that he had seen the hull panting. Peary said all ships panted. Peary was accompanying the delivery party to Liverpool, so he'd get a first-hand look at the panting for the initial leg of the trip. He wasn't going on to New York for reasons he didn't care to discuss. Peary ordered Andrews to lead an inspection party to New York and back on Olympic, and when the time came, on Titanic. Watch the hulls, Peary said. Watch everything. If we have to, we can double up steel on the seams over the bottom. We can stiffen the superstructure. We can do the same to Titanic. These are big ships, but they are only ships. Perry was not going to let a slight tremor in the ship's hull derail the spectacular party he had orchestrated for launching Titanic and sending Olympic off on its maiden voyage. The chartered steamer Duke of Argyle brought 400 reporters, White Star executives, and guests, including this time J.P. Morgan. All morning, the crowd streamed into the shipyard. Dignitaries toured the yard, then sat in the crimson and white grandstands. On the banks of the river, 150,000 people waited to watch Titanic move for the first time, and to wave as Olympic sailed for Liverpool, Southampton, and New York in the afternoon. Olympic towered over Belfast. Against the pewter sky of the spring morning, the ship seemed to glow in its white star livery of dark gray hull, bright white superstructure, and yellow piping. Its four yellow funnels, striped at top with gray bands, rose higher into the sky than any other man-made structure in Ireland. Under the gantry, where it had risen for the past year and a half, Titanic rested on wooden platforms coated with 22 tons of tallow to ease its passage into the water. At noon, the bosses blew their whistles. More than 200 shipyard workers, who looked like ants beneath the gigantic hull, scurried to safety. The bosses counted their men and discovered that one of them was missing. After a frantic search, they found a laborer, James Dobbins, pinned beneath one of the wooden timbers that had been removed to free the ship. Dobbins was the third man to die working on Titanic. The first had been a 15-year-old rivet catcher, Samuel Scott, who'd fallen from a ladder into the open hull of the ship. The second, a 19-year-old heater boy, John Kelly, had dropped from scaffolding to the floor of the concrete slipway. Six men had died building Olympic. After the ambulance carted Dobbins away, a barrage of red signal flares exploded in the air. The voices of 150,000 people faded, and the clatter of the waterfront fell silent, as though all of Belfast had drawn a deep breath. Peary stood in the front row of the grandstand, waved his arm in a circle over his head, and shouted his launch command. Now! Two of the bosses released the last of the restraining cables. The launch cradle broke free of the greased slipway, 
and Titanic creaked and groaned until a riot of horns, whistles, and cheering drowned out the sounds of the ship's battle with inertia. In seconds, it was sliding smoothly, picking up speed until it was afloat in the river and stopped dead by straining tugs and anchors. Alongside the glistening Olympic just upriver, the raw, unfinished Titanic looked like the tough cousin of a dandy. Peary, Ismay, Morgan, their wives, and their title guests had lunch in the Harland and Wolf dining room. They lifted their glasses to their new ships and then again to toast Margaret Peary. Her birthday, May 31st, happened to coincide with launch day. Afterward, 500 men and women in the White Star and Harland and Wolf parties boarded Olympic as the Belfast City Band played a selection of rags, waltzes, and marches. At 4.15, the band struck up Rule Britannia. The crew stowed the gangways, and longshoremen slipped the lines free of the dock. Tugs on the bow and the outboard side of the ship roared in belched smoke. Almost imperceptibly at first, and then as inexorably as a force of nature, Olympic moved toward the mouth of the River Logan. Before Olympic had faded from view, the bunting was off the grandstands, bosses were barking instead of smiling, and 2,000 men were crawling all over Titanic at the fitting out dock. Without its engines and boilers, the ship rode high on its lines, half the red-painted bottom visible above the water. From across the river, an observer could easily measure the progress of fitting out. Titanic would sink deeper and deeper into the water until it sailed on its maiden voyage, scheduled for March 20th, 1912. Four months into fitting out Titanic, Thomas Andrews was savoring the predictable routines of building another on-time ship. With the good weather and a full order book, the Belfast Yard was alive around the clock. Every few days, couriers from the Harland and Wolf Yards in Scotland and England arrived with progress reports, which Andrews compiled for monthly meetings of the company directors. Olympic was such a magnificent, profitable ship that Ismay was thinking about ordering a third to make a trio of perfect sisters. After Olympic had completed its first crossing in five days, 16 hours, and 42 minutes, at an average speed of 21.7 knots with five boilers unlit, he cabled Peary from New York. He told Peary that he was thoroughly pleased with Olympic and offered his warm and sincere congratulations, signing the telegram, as always, Yamsey. Ismay followed up with a letter in which he pointed out a few problems. The mattresses were a bit too soft, accentuating the vibrations from the engines. The first-class reception room needed 50 additional cane chairs and 10 tables because it was so popular. A potato peeler should be installed in the crew galley. The first-class bathrooms needed cigar holders. And the first-class suites on B-deck could be enlarged because there was plenty of space for private promenades. It was the busiest time Andrews had ever known at Harland and Wolf, but he kept pace by working steady shifts from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. On the afternoon of September 21, 1911, he was about to go home to his wife and infant daughter when the courier from Southampton arrived. Just after noon the day before, the dispatch from Peary said, the 360-foot heavy cruiser HMS Hawk had slammed into Olympic which was leaving Southampton Harbor on its fifth voyage. Hawk was a 20-year-old warship with five-inch thick steel plating, armed with guns, torpedoes, and an underwater ram made of steel and concrete for sinking enemy ships. Hawk's bow tore a massive triangular hole in Olympic's flank, just above the starboard propeller, where the hull tapered into the overhanging stern. The warship's ram punctured Olympic below the waterline, People on shore a mile away heard the collision. Olympic was never in danger of sinking. The liner was under the control of a pilot when the collision occurred, a maritime custom that put an officer with explicit knowledge of local waters aboard an arriving or departing ship. Though E.J. Smith was Olympic's captain, the pilot was making navigational decisions in the harbor. After the collision, Smith instantly took over and brought his ship into Osborne Bay on the Isle of Wight. He unloaded the passengers onto tenders that took them back to the mainland and inspected the damage. Two compartments were flooded, but the watertight doors had worked perfectly. 
On the next high tide, Smith took Olympic back to Southampton, where the Harland and Wolf repair yard went into emergency shifts to close the holes with steel plating below the waterline and wood above. As soon as possible, the courier told Andrews, Olympic would come back to Belfast for dry docking. The holding of the largest ship in the world was front page news for weeks as an admiralty court held an inquiry to assess blame for the collision. HMS Hawk's captain, Commander William Blunt, claimed that the enormous suction of Olympic's giant propellers had drawn his cruiser into the liner. Captain Smith said Blunt was showing off for Olympic's passengers lining the rail as the ship left port and misjudged the clearance on the stern. The Admiralty sued White Star for damages to Hawk. White Star sued the Admiralty for damages to Olympic. White Star lost but took no action against Smith, who was the company's most senior captain and the highest paid sailor on the ocean. Ismay believed Smith more than he believed the Admiralty. Ismay and Peary were annoyed by the interruption in service and the bad publicity surrounding the collision, but it gave them the opportunity to point out that Olympic was not only the biggest and most luxurious ship afloat, but the strongest. While Captain Smith was ashore testifying at the inquiry, he also gave interviews to the press. My ship's frame took the shock well, he said. There was no panic. Many passengers did not even know there had been a collision, so slight was the shock felt in the dining saloon. The watertight doors held the compartment sealed. Anyhow, Olympic is unsinkable, and Titanic will be the same when she is put in commission. Either vessel could be cut in halves, and each section would remain afloat. I ventured to add that even if the engines and boilers were to fall through their bottoms, the vessels would remain afloat. Smith's conclusions about Olympic's seaworthiness were reassuring, but the collision left Andrews with an enormous problem. Only one dry dock on Earth was big enough to take Olympic. At the moment, it was occupied by the ship's half-finished sister. Titanic had to come out of the dry dock, which meant it was going to be at least a month late. Perry had skipped Olympic's first crossing to New York in May because he had been plagued with a pain in his groin and a constant urge to urinate. He'd left the ship in Southampton. A week later, in London, a surgeon said it was only a matter of time before Peary was either going to keel over from the pain or agree to have his prostate gland removed. The gland was enlarged and getting bigger. He might have a cancer. He might not. No matter what, the problem wasn't going to disappear by itself. To Peary, surgeons fell into the same hazy category as palm readers, he decided to wait and see what happened. The pain and urination problems were intermittent. As soon as they eased up, he went back to work and waited for the next round. When Hawk rammed Olympic, he was just getting over an agonizing bout with the ailment. But he was feeling pretty good. Perry thought it would inspire confidence if he and Ismay rode their crippled ship from Southampton to Belfast. The wounded Olympic steamed back into the River Loggin on the morning of October 5th. When the ship was dry docked, Peary and Andrews were shocked at the extent of the gashes in its hull. But they could not banish their pride. The collision with HMS Hawk would cost White Star more than 250,000 pounds in repairs and lost revenue. Titanic was behind schedule. But Olympic had survived a blow that would have sunk most ships. What the surveyors found farther forward on the ship a few days later was not such good news. Under the navigation bridge, right where Andrews had watched the hull panting during the sea trials, there were cracks in the steel. Not big cracks, small ones radiating from the windows and rivets. They didn't have much of a pattern except that they were in the front of the ship on both sides. The surveyors also found cracks on both sides of the ship where the plates of the main hull joined the plates of the bottom. The cracks weren't serious, but some steel was moving that shouldn't be moving. There was no time to do anything about the bow of Olympic, but Peary, Andrews, and Ismay decided to reinforce Titanic before sending it to sea. Any misgivings Ismay had about the strength of Olympic's hull did not prevent him from planning an order for the third ship on October 23rd. At a ceremony in Peary's office, Work officially began on Harland and Wolf Hull No. 433, with signatures in the order book. Construction would begin the following month. 
Ismay said he would name the ship Britannic. The first White Star ship to bear that name had made more than 300 voyages in 29 years of service before retiring in 1903. Olympic left the dry dock on November 14, 1911, a week before the riveters stitched together the first pieces of Britannic under the gantry crane. Andrews decided to keep working on Titanic at the outfitting wharf and bring it back into dry dock for propellers and bottom paint in early February. Moving the ship once instead of twice would save three or four days. White Star was still selling tickets for Titanic's first voyage dated March 20th, hoping that Harland and Wolf could make up the time lost due to the Hawk incident. Work slowed predictably as December and January brought rain, snow, and dismally short days. The engines, the boilers, and the rest of the machinery were done. The four funnels were on the ship. The bulk of the work was inside now. In January, Andrews pulled riveters and platers from Britannic and put them to work in closing the A-deck promenades on both sides of Titanic. The enclosed promenade allowed for the addition of another cafe, but most importantly, it strengthened the ship where Olympic was cracking. The added steel stiffened the front of the ship from just behind the bridge to the base of the second funnel. Andrews also reinforced the seams in the bow where the double plates of the bottom met the single plates of the main hull. If Titanic panted like Olympic, the extra steel would reduce the chances that cracks in the hull would develop at that point. He was building Britannic from the same set of plans he'd used for the first two ships, so he made notes in red pencil to add the steel in the superstructure and bow seams. In late February, Andrews put Titanic in the dry dock to fit its propellers, give it a final coat of bottom paint, and trim the rudder. Just as the men finished timbering the hull, the bosses shouted at them to stop work and stand by for new orders. Olympic was coming back. They had to flood the dock and tow Titanic back into the river. Andrews could hardly believe his bad luck. Two days out of New York, about 750 miles south of Newfoundland, Olympic had started shuddering violently. The ship had thrown a propeller blade. It took Smith a week to limp home on two engines. Replacing a propeller blade was only a five-day job, but Titanic's March 15th delivery date and March 20th maiden voyage were lost. While Olympic was in the dry dock, a Board of Trade surveyor inspected the front of the ship. The results stunned Andrews. The fractures on the bridge deck had grown, and there were more loose rivets and plates on the seams above the double bottom. Andrews wrote to Peary, telling him that he had added steel to Titanic. They had to do the same thing to Olympic as soon as possible. E.J. Smith arrived in Belfast to take command of Titanic for its sea trials and maiden voyage on the afternoon of March 31, 1912. The first crossings of the newest White Star liner would be Smith's last, after 43 years at sea. He was more than ready for retirement. When Smith boarded, the ship was swarming with men on last-minute assignments to paint and polish it for departure the following morning at dawn. In his full-dress White Star uniform, he led a porter carrying his valise over the gangway into the first-class reception parlor and up the staircase to the boat deck. Titanic's master's suite was slightly larger than the one he had aboard Olympic. It was the most luxurious officer's stateroom afloat, with a parlor the size of three ordinary cabins, a separate bedroom, and a private bath with a copper plum ceramic tub. Smith's spacious suite on Titanic was a long way from the cabin boy's hammock on a square rigger where he'd begun his life as a mariner when he was 13 years old. The son of a potter, he'd given up a dull tradesman's village near Newcastle for the hope of the sea in 1869. The routines of shipboard life soon became second nature to him. A week after his 18th birthday, Smith sat for his officer's papers. He sailed as a relief man out of Liverpool for six years, finally landing a permanent berth as fourth officer on White Star's Celtic in 1880. Thomas Ismay gave him command of the 565-foot Majestic in 1895. Since then, Smith had developed a following among first-class passengers, some of whom would travel only on liners under his command. He was charming at dinner, 
inspired confidence during tours of his navigation bridge, and White Star's executives thought enough of him to trust him with their best ships. In 1901, when he brought Majestic into New York with a particularly brilliant passenger list of the rich and famous, a newspaper reporter dubbed him the Millionaire's Captain. During Smith's rise to the top of White Star's officer's roster, he weathered the consequences of occasional poor judgment. Most recently, the Admiralty had blamed him for Olympic's collision with HMS Hawk. Before that, Olympic's rudder had nicked a tugboat in New York Harbor, tearing a hole in its deckhouse. Smith admitted no error, but White Star paid a $10,000 settlement to the tug's owner. Smith also had a reputation for high-speed, flamboyant arrivals and departures in the tight confines of harbors. He grounded Coptic in Rio de Janeiro in 1891, ran Republic aground off Sandy Hook in 1899, and put Adriatic on a sandbar in Ambrose Channel near New York in 1909. None of those incidents killed anybody or cost the company too much money, so Smith's upward progression within White Star never slowed. Olympic had performed so well that Peary, Ismay, and Andrews scheduled Titanic for only a single day of sea trials. On April 2nd, Belfast Loch was almost flat calm, with the sun on the eastern horizon beginning to banish the light fog that had settled between the headlands. At dawn, Smith gave the command to hoist the gangways and throw off the mooring lines. Eight hours earlier, the firemen had ignited 20 of the 29 boilers, so Titanic had a full head of steam. Smith walked to the wing of the bridge to be sure the tugs were in position to ease the ship away from the pier and keep it in the middle of the river. Titanic could not maneuver at slow speed without help from the tugs. Smith ordered a head slow on the port and starboard main engines, leaving the center turbine on standby. He stood squared up at the center wheelhouse window with his hands clasped behind his back and gave instructions over his shoulder. His voice was soft and calm, as if he were ordering a meal from a waiter. Thomas Andrews stood off to the side of the bridge with Board of Trade Surveyor Francis Carruthers and White Star's Harold Sanderson. Ismay would make Titanic's maiden voyage, but he would not join the ship until Southampton. Sanderson was representing White Star to formally accept delivery of Titanic after the sea trials. Smith rounded Copeland Island, entering open water, and rang down all ahead half. For an hour, he zigged and zagged, settling on each new heading for several minutes, feeling the motion of the ship to determine if its props, rudder, and hull were enduring the pressures of turning. Like Olympic, Titanic took plenty of lead time to change course. After Smith threw the helm hard in either direction, at least 30 seconds passed before the bow began to tick through the points of the compass. Once into the turn, the ship was rock solid. Smith slowed Titanic to a dead stop. He shut down the center engine and ran the port engine full ahead and the starboard engine full astern, pivoting the ship clockwise in a complete circle. He performed the same maneuver counterclockwise. Then he rang all ahead half. Titanic reached 12 knots running in a straight line. Smith held that for 10 minutes. He felt nothing out of the ordinary. For the first time, Smith rang all ahead full. 10 minutes later, Titanic was making 21 knots. The newly enclosed promenade and the extra steel in the bow seemed to have stiffened the ship. Titanic's hull was panting, but well within normal limits. Titanic was ready to go to work. At sunset, Titanic was back at the dock in Belfast. In the sitting room of the master's suite, Board of Trade Inspector Francis Carruthers signed the Certificate of Seaworthiness, effective for one year from April 2, 1912. Immediately afterward, Thomas Andrews and White Star Vice President Harold Sanderson transferred ownership of Titanic from Harland and Wolfe to the White Star Line. A new White Star ship, always called first at Liverpool for ceremonial inspection by the people of its home port, but Ismay ordered Smith to take Titanic straight to Southampton. Coaling, provisioning, and loading would take five days. Easter Sunday, April 7th, was a holiday. Olympic would sail westbound on April 3rd and eastbound on April 11th. Titanic had to leave Southampton on April 10th synchronized on opposite schedules with its sister to make the most of two-ship express service. 
Smith told Ismay that he had a couple of problems that had to be ironed out, or Titanic might not get out of Southampton at all. Chief Engineer Joseph Bell had just told him that the forward starboard coal bunker was on fire. Smith and Bell had dealt with bunker fires aboard steamships, which were not uncommon. Because wet coal is more combustible than dry coal, water would make the fire worse. The only way to extinguish it was to feed the smoldering coal into the furnaces. When the bunker was empty, the fire would be out. They would then repair the damage to the surrounding steel bulkheads. Smith ordered Bell to keep a gang of men spraying the bulkhead behind the fire 24 hours a day to keep it from warping as much as possible. The bunker fire didn't worry Smith enough to delay Titanic's departure from Belfast. He had consulted Andrews, who told him there was no danger to the safety of the ship as long as they kept the bulkheads around the bunker wet. After the fire was out, Smith should make sure the scorched steel was scrubbed and painted before they reached New York. The American immigration inspectors had to certify the ship as safe for the return voyage, and a burned-out coal bunker wouldn't look good. Smith's second problem was far more of a threat to delay his departure from Southampton. Ordinarily, coaling a ship was routine, but two months earlier, miners had walked off the job in Wales, Scotland, and England, the White Star storage bins at the harbor were empty. Smith needed 6,500 tons of coal when he got to Southampton, or Titanic wasn't going anywhere. Ismay said he was working on it. At midnight on April 4th, tugs eased Titanic alongside the White Star docks in Southampton. None of the officers or crew had gotten much sleep, but the ship had performed beautifully on the 570-mile run through a night and a day from Belfast. The Irish Sea remained calm. There was very little vibration or sense of movement. It was like being in a good hotel on shore. On Friday, April 5th, Smith left enough officers aboard Titanic for round-the-clock watches on the bridge and went home to his wife and daughter for a final few nights ashore. He ordered his ship dressed with all flags flying between its masts in honor of Good Friday and turned Titanic over to the battalions of stevedores and stewards preparing the ship to receive passengers at first light on Wednesday morning. On the afternoon of Friday, April 5th, Ismay told Smith that he had solved the coal problem. He'd canceled the voyages of White Star's Adriatic and Oceanic, and of the IMM liners New York, Philadelphia, and St. Louis. Titanic would get 4,425 tons of coal from those five ships. Added to the 1,400 tons he already had left over from sea trials, and the run from Belfast, it would be enough. Titanic's officers spent the last night before sailing on board. First Officer William Murdoch, the son of a sea captain, had gone to sea aboard square riggers sailing between Liverpool and South America. He was so natural a mariner that he'd sat for the second mate's exam after four years instead of five. His last assignment had been as first officer aboard Olympic. Second Officer Charles Lighttoller's last assignment had been his first officer on Oceanic. The son of a mill owner, he'd gone to sea as a teenager, quit after three shipwrecks and a near-fatal bout with malaria. Prospected for gold in the Yukon, failed at that, became a cowboy in Alberta, didn't care for that life either, and had returned to the White Star Line 12 years before that night in Southampton. He was a devoted Christian scientist, Delighted to be rescued from idle days or weeks at the dock waiting for coal. At dinner aboard Titanic, he told the other officers that he was a very contented chap to have the chance to sail on so wonderful a ship. Chief Officer Henry Wilde had also begun his career aboard sailing ships. Wilde was pleased to be sailing with his friend E.J. Smith, but he had different feelings about Titanic than Lightoller. After dinner, he wrote a farewell note to his sister. I still don't like this ship, Wilde said in closing. I have a queer feeling about it. At sunrise on Wednesday, April 10th, Smith returned to Titanic to oversee the arrival of the rest of the crew. 861 men signed ship's papers as seamen, firemen, engineers, saloon stewards, bedroom stewards, chefs, and waiters. Also signing were a squash professional, a gymnasium instructor, two lifeguards for the swimming pool, and four Turkish bath attendants. 23 women signed on, 18 stewardesses, two cashiers, a masseuse, a Turkish bath attendant, 
and a matron to serve as a chaperone for single women traveling in third class. Stewardess Violet Jessup came over from Olympic to add experience to Titanic's female crew. After her childhood in Argentina, she had gone to sea at 21 as a stewardess aboard the steamship Orinoco. Except for a few brief spells between voyages, she had not lived ashore since. The members of the ship's string band were among the first people to come aboard. Band leader Wallace Hartley, three cellists, a pianist, two violinists, and two violists stowed their personal gear in their second-class staterooms, then set up their stands off the reception hall to play for arriving passengers. They were masters of the White Star Music Book of 352 tunes, including Scott Joplin Rags, Selections from Carmen, The Emperor Waltz, Rule Britannia, God Save the King, Yankee Doodle, The Star-Spangled Banner, and a selection of Episcopal hymns. The band played in two ensembles, one in first class, one in second, coming together for occasional galas. The newspapers in New York and London touted the maiden voyage of Titanic as an even more glamorous high society event than that of Olympic or any of the new Cunarders. William Randolph Hearst's New York American reported that Titanic's 329 first-class passengers were worth a total of $500 million. Other papers celebrated the size of the ship. If Titanic were stood on its stern, its bow would top the Metropolitan Life Insurance Building in New York, at 700 feet, the tallest building in the world. Headline writers on both sides of the Atlantic gushed over the wonder ship, the last word in luxury, the unsinkable ship, and the biggest ship in the world. The Wall Street Journal dubbed it the Millionaire's Special. The London Standard declared White Star the victor over Cunard. In the fight during the coming season, there will be a scent of battle all the way from New York to the shores of this country, a contest of sea giants in which the Titanic will doubtless take highest honors. There were also detractors. The editors of The Economist snarled at shipbuilders attempting to lick creation with monster ships that involve too great a concentration of life and wealth in a single bottom. J.P. Morgan followed the news about Titanic, but he was going to miss its maiden voyage. The United States had relaxed the import duties on old works of art, and he was preoccupied with shipping his treasures home. Perry, too, was unable to make the trip. In the middle of February, in constant pain and crippled by fever, he'd been ready to try anything. A surgeon had released his bladder in an agonizing procedure using a probe into his urethra, but the blockage had returned within a week. In early March, Peary had risked an operation to reduce the size of his swollen prostate, for which the odds were against survival. When Titanic was ready to sail from Southampton, Peary was recovering from surgery aboard his yacht Valiant in the Baltic Sea, battling the sepsis that had invaded his guts. Recuperating on the yacht had been Margaret Peary's idea. Valiant was 307 feet long, with a crew of 50, the largest private ship in the world. Perry would want for nothing, and his wife knew that he would have loathed the steady stream of well-wishers if he were at home in London or Belfast. On Valiant, only she, a doctor, four nurses, and the crew would witness the suffering and weakness of a man who had been near death for weeks. At 11.15, Chief Engineer Bell came to the bridge and told Smith that the bunker fire was still burning, but that it should be out by the next day. His men were shoveling the smoldering coal into the furnaces. The steel bulkhead behind the bunker was warping a bit, but not too badly. Bell told Smith there was no reason to delay the departure. The chief purser reported to Smith that 329 passengers, five of them children, had embarked in first class. 285, including 22 children, in second class. And 710, of which 76 were children, in third class. It was not a full load, but the voyage would still be profitable. At 11.45, Smith sounded the ship's whistle to order visitors ashore. The crew swung the gangways and sealed the boarding hatches. From the bridge, Smith directed his officers by telephone as they threw the mooring lines to the dock. He had taken hundreds of ships to sea, but the exhilaration of breaking free of land had never left him. The thumping chorus of the tugboat engines rose several octaves as Titanic moved away from the pier and out into the river test. Over the noise of the tugs, 
Smith heard what sounded like a volley of rifle shots on the port side. He ran to the bridge wing and saw the 560-foot SS New York heading straight for his ship. It was the HMS Hawk accident all over again. Titanic's propellers had created a maelstrom of suction, snapping New York's mooring lines to set the liner adrift. It was helpless 50 feet away and moving fast toward Titanic's stern. Black smoke belched from one of the tugboats as it accelerated around New York's bow, its crew scrambling to throw a line to men on the deck of the drifting ship. Smith's celebrated career was about to end in ignominy. Clutching at one last straw, he bellowed to the helmsman inside the bridge, port engine ahead full. He had never heard of a captain fending off another ship with his own propeller wash, but it might work. The engine room took an interminable 30 seconds to respond to his command from the navigation bridge. New York was 40 feet away. 20. At last, a foaming brown hump erupted from Titanic's port propeller. Churning mud from the bottom of the river, the wave surged toward the drifting ship, slammed into its flank, and stopped New York four feet from Titanic's stern. Smith walked back to the center of his navigation bridge. In a voice that betrayed nothing of the dire moment that had just passed, he ordered all ahead slow and set a course across the English Channel for the five-hour run to Cherbourg. After a stop there for passengers and another the following day in Queenstown, on the southern tip of Ireland, he could settle into the placid routines of the five-day crossing to New York. Four nights after leaving Queenstown, Bruce Ismay was drifting off to sleep in the best stateroom on Titanic. The parlor suite had two bedrooms, a sitting room, a private promenade, book-matched walnut paneling, and a fireplace. The voyage had been nothing but pleasure so far. Titanic was a good-humored ship, with a genial feeling among the passengers and crew wherever he went. Mechanically, it was performing perfectly. Andrews told him that Britannic would be even better. With a third Olympic-class sister, even a fourth was not out of the question, he would be competing with Cunard on even terms for the first time since his father had died. White Star was having its best year financially since his brother James had quit after the sale to Morgan. From time to time, Bruce envied his brother's bucolic life raising show cattle in Dorset, but not that night on Titanic. Ismay was finally surrendering to sleep when something changed. His bed shuddered, only for an instant, but enough to fully wake him. Instinct pulled him to his feet, into his slippers, and out to the corridor. He asked a passing steward what had happened. The steward said he had no idea. Ismay stood there, sensing the heartbeats of his ship. Nothing. Probably nothing. No, the engine slowed down. Then they stopped completely. Ismay went back into his sitting room, put on an overcoat, and started for the bridge. Something had definitely happened. After tucking in her first-class passengers, stewardess Violet Jessup returned to her stateroom on E-deck. She was in her nightgown, reading, happy about her new home and grateful for the electric lights, when for an instant she thought she felt something different about the engines. Jessup had learned to be alert to the rhythms of a ship. Every change meant something. She dropped her magazine to the coverlet at her side and listened more carefully. She distinctly heard a low, growling sound. She leaned over the side of her top bunk. Her roommate, Elizabeth Leather, who had been at sea longer than she had, was staring up at her over the side of her berth. As calmly as if she were commenting on eggs and bacon, Elizabeth said, It sounds as if something has happened. In a two-berth cabin in the men's compartment at the bow on F deck, Olaus Abelseth had been asleep for two hours. He was returning to his homestead farm in South Dakota from a visit to Norway, traveling with two cousins who were in another part of the ship. As a favor to a friend from his town in Norway, he was looking after 16-year-old Karen Abelseth. Karen was not a close relative, but Ole had known her all her life. Directly beneath Ole Abelseth, the ship trembled violently. His roommate, Adolf Humblin, woke at the same time. Humblin was also escorting a young woman, Anna Salcheltsvik, to America. What was that? Humblin said. I don't know, Abelseth replied. 
but we'd better get out of here and find the girls. They dressed, put on their overcoats, and started back to the women's compartments at the stern of the ship. Thomas Andrews felt his desk move. He paused for a second, then continued doing what he always did in the evening aboard a new ship, making new lists in his notebook and crossing items off old lists. The Harland and Wolf electrician, ship fitters, carpenters, and plumbers were doing a good job of working the wrinkles out of Titanic. The doors of some of the third-class cabins and crew dormitories had been tight in their jams. They'd shaved and rehung them. Some of the windows in the engineer's smoking room on the boat deck had been painted shut. They'd opened them. Only half the burners on one of the stoves in the third-class galley worked. Andrews had written hundreds of notes, most of them about minor flaws that his men had easily fixed. A few seconds after Andrews felt his desk move, the engine stopped. He stood, took his suit coat from its peg near the door, tucked his notebook under his arm, and went to take a look around. Fred Barrett was in boiler room six, ticking off the minutes until the end of his watch. He was a tall, beefy 28-year-old sailor from Liverpool, who had gone into the coal pits when he was 13, survived five years in the mines, shipped out as a trimmer, and never worked ashore again. He became a fireman, then a leading fireman aboard New York. Barrett knew how to rake a good, hot fire, and when he was put in charge of a boiler room gang, he wasn't afraid to use his fists to keep his men moving. When Ismay canceled New York's voyage because of the coal strike, Barrett sprinted to the hiring hall and got himself a berth on the only ship leaving Southampton. He boarded Titanic three hours before it sailed. Barrett was struck stupid the first time he climbed down the ladder into the enormous stokehold. Each boiler room was 50 feet long, spanned the 92-foot beam of the ship, and rose 30 feet up into the hull. He had never in his life been in so large an enclosed space. Barrett worked four hours on, eight hours off. He took his turn stoking the furnaces, and as leading fireman, kept tabs on the eight men on his watch in boiler room six. For the extra responsibility, he got 10 shillings more per voyage than a fireman's wage of six pounds. Barrett had been at sea long enough to understand that the maiden voyage on any ship was never easy. But the first three days on Titanic had been hell. Nobody knew his way around. The thing was a maze. It took him a half hour to find his mess room and bunk, another half hour to figure out the way to his boiler room through the fireman's tunnel. The worst part of the voyage so far had been the bunker fire. It had been burning when he'd come aboard in Southampton, and he'd had the bad luck of being assigned to the boilers right next to it. The chief engineer had ordered extra trimmers to haul the burning coal to the furnaces, putting a lot of extra traffic in front of Barrett's boilers. Barrett had also had to put up with the hose gang spraying the bulkhead to keep the fire from spreading or warping the walls of the bunker. The water turned the air into a soggy mist and made the dust stickier. Everybody in his boiler room had had to work with neckerchiefs over their noses and mouths. The trimmers had gotten the last of the burning coal out of the starboard forward bunker on the evening of April 13th. Just before Barrett's watch ended on the night of April 14th, the bunker that had been on fire was finally cleaned up. At 11.35, second engineer James Hesketh came around to inspect it. The aft bulkhead of the bunker looked fine, maybe not good as new, but fit for sea. To check the bunker's forward bulkhead, Hesketh and Barrett went through the watertight door to an empty reserve coal bin in the compartment between boiler room six and cargo hold two. The steel there looked okay too, Hesketh bent to look at the seam where the bulk had met the deck. There was a little bit of warping, but nothing serious. Barrett felt the shudder of the engine's changing speed, looked at Hesketh, and held his eyes. The sound in the boiler rooms was always a deafening cacophony of clanging shovels, slamming furnace doors, and the roar of the fires themselves. Barrett missed the sharp, grinding sound coming from the cargo hold just forward of where he stood with Hesketh. By the time the noise registered, the watertight door alarm was blaring, and he heard the door squealing in its steel tracks. He and Hesketh broke for the closing door. Just before they reached it, a flat stream of green, cold water took their legs out from under them. After a dinner party hosted by banker George Widener, 
Captain Smith was in the chart room on the starboard side. The bridge was open to the weather, but the chart room was heated, a much better place to finish his cigar. The temperature had dropped 10 degrees since he'd gone down for dinner. Smith took off his coat and started checking his ship's position. On the bridge, Murdoch was in command of the watch, with two junior officers, a quartermaster on the helm, and two seamen. Lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee were in the crow's nest on the forward mast, connected to the bridge by telephone. Ordinarily, Smith would have been in his cabin getting ready to turn in, but he had felt the temperature drop after dinner and was worried about ice. A relatively warm winter had littered the shipping lanes off Newfoundland with far more than the usual number of bergs. On spring crossings, Smith and every other captain on the North Atlantic plotted their courses a few degrees to the south to avoid the ice drifting down from Greenland. Earlier in the evening, Smith had ordered a course change to take Titanic even farther south of the reported ice because the Marconi operators had been handing him ice reports from other ships all day. In the chart room, Smith felt Titanic shiver under his feet. In five strides, he was on the bridge. What is it, Murdoch? he asked. An iceberg, sir, Murdoch answered. I hard a starboard it and reversed the engines. I was going to hard a port round it, but she was too close. I could not do any more. I have closed the watertight doors. Five minutes after Ismay's shuddering bed woke him, he walked quickly along the corridor in the officer's quarters, past the Marconi room, and out into the chilly air of the navigation bridge. There were many more men than usual on watch, which alone told him that something was very wrong. Ismay pulled Smith out of earshot of the others. They stood face to face for a few long seconds, then Ismay pivoted and rushed out the open door onto the bridge wing. Ismay was still in his pajamas, slippers, and overcoat, and even with the ship sitting still, the frigid air knifed into him as he ran aft on the boat deck. In a minute, he was in the engineer's smoking hut, then clacking down the metal staircase through six decks. At the bottom, he emerged on the catwalk in the hideously silent cavern of the engine room. Just then, the engines came to life. After Ismay left the bridge, Smith had ordered all ahead half. Whatever had happened to his ship was not going to sink it, but there was little doubt that he had to make landfall as quickly as possible. He sent a seaman to wake up Wilde and Lightoller and went to the Marconi room. Smith told Harold Bride to try to get a message through to Cape Race, Newfoundland. Bride said he was barely in range, but he would try. Have Cape Race relay a message by transatlantic cable to White Star in London, Smith said. Tell them the Titanic is damaged and heading for Halifax. Repairs at Holland and Wolf might be necessary. The carpenter arrived on the bridge and told Smith that the ship had water in three forward compartments, but he wasn't sure how fast it was coming in. Fourth officer Joseph Boxhall, who had also been inspecting the damage, told him the mailroom on the starboard side, 10 feet above the bottom, was knee-deep in water. Chief Engineer Bell reported that the firemen were working in waist-deep water, damping their furnaces in boiler room six to prevent a boiler explosion. Smith ordered all stop. A minute later, the engines were still. Two minutes after that, slowed more quickly than usual by the wounds in its bow, Titanic was dead in the water. To Smith, the picture of what had happened to his ship was getting murkier instead of clearer. He ordered Wilde to uncover the lifeboats. Andrews rushed onto the bridge, pulled Smith aside, and the two men left together. Passing the Marconi room, Smith told Jack Phillips to send a distress signal to all ships and stations. He handed him a slip of paper with a rough estimate of Titanic's position and said that Boxhall would get him a more accurate fix in a few minutes. Smith and Andrews used crew passageways and staircases to avoid alarming passengers. On F deck, three decks up from the bottom, they saw water in the squash court. They saw water in cargo holds one and two. That meant that the first three watertight compartments were flooding, and the water was already three decks up. They climbed up to E deck to skirt the closed watertight doors and went aft until they reached the engineer's staircase. In the engine room, Bell told them that at the last report, the water in boiler room six was above the six-foot-high Stoker's catwalks. 
he had ordered Fred Barrett and his men to evacuate the compartment by climbing the emergency ladder over the bulkhead. Smith, Andrews, and Bell went forward to inspect the boiler rooms. Numbers one through four looked dry. The faces of the firemen and trimmers were smudged masks of bewilderment as the three most important men on their ship rushed past them without a nod. A rumor had spread that the ship had run aground off Newfoundland. Boiler room five had some water in it, but not much. Andrews climbed the ladder and looked over the top of the bulkhead into number six. Through a fog of acrid steam, he saw that water had reached the middle of the still hot boilers. They hissed and crackled as the ocean flowed around them. Ismay was on the bridge when Smith and Andrews got back. He could not remember ever having seen fear in either man, and he recognized it instantly in their dull, wide eyes and the tension in their shoulders. Both of them had always radiated confidence like lanterns giving light. Seeing them without it was terrifying. Smith led Ismay and Andrews into the chart room. Even the warmth did nothing to ease the grimness in their faces. It's not good, Smith told Ismay. The ship is sinking. If we're lucky, it will last until help gets here. He looked at Andrews. How long do you reckon? Andrews shook his head. The laws of strength and buoyancy that had inspired him for his entire life doomed Titanic. Thousands of tons of seawater would quickly outweigh the ability of the ship's hull to support it. Soon, Andrews said. Soon. Smith bolted from the chart room. In his dependable, calm voice, he ordered his officers to their emergency stations. Launch the lifeboats, he told them. Now. Murdoch was in charge of the eight boats on the starboard side, Lightoller the eight on the port side. Wilde would oversee all of them and lend a hand where he was needed. Nobody mentioned that there was room for fewer than half of the ship's passengers and crew in the lifeboats. Smith had not told them what he, Ismay, and Andrews knew. The ship was sinking fast. Wilde, Murdoch, and Lightoller had no reason to doubt that Titanic would stay afloat at least long enough for another ship to reach it. In the Marconi room, Jack Phillips tapped out the Morse code letters CQD, a call for help, followed by MGY, Titanic's call sign, and the corrected position Boxhall had given him. 41 degrees, 46 minutes north, 50 degrees, 14 minutes west. Phillips's fist was a blur over his sparking key, his plea for help flying through the night to headphones on ships and at the shore station at Cape Race, Newfoundland. Titanic was not alone on the North Atlantic. The steamships La Provence and Mount Temple heard Titanic's first CQD, but their replies from less powerful transmitters were too faint for Phillips to understand. Finally, Phillips heard the Cunard liner Carpathia loud and clear. Carpathia's telegrapher, Harold Cottam, had picked up Titanic's CQD. He asked if Phillips knew that the Cape Cod shore station was trying to relay a batch of telegrams for Titanic passengers. Phillips ignored that message. Come at once, he tapped. We have struck a berg. It's a CQD, old man. Position 4146 North, 5014 West. Carpathia replied, Shall I tell my captain? Do you require assistance? Phillips tapped out. Yes, come quick. Carpathia was eastbound out of New York, 58 miles from Titanic's position. Its captain, Arthur Rostron, immediately changed course, sent Cottom back to the Marconi shack to listen for updates on Titanic's position, and ordered his chief engineer to put extra stokers in the boiler room. Carpathia's single engine was built to drive the 541-foot ship at a top speed of 14 and a half knots. Rostron knew he could stretch that to 17 knots for a sprint and reach the sinking ship in three and a half hours. Rostron knew Titanic would easily stay afloat until Carpathia arrived. While Phillips was telling as much of the world as possible that Titanic was in distress, the scene a few feet away on the boat deck was more typical of a crowd of after-dinner strollers. No one had told the passengers that their ship was sinking. 
and few of them were interested in climbing into a creaky wooden boat and being lowered 70 feet down to the freezing Atlantic on a cold, moonless night. At 12.45 a.m., one hour and five minutes after impact, Murdoch sent lifeboat number seven into the sea with 29 first-class passengers plus three seamen to man the oars. The boat was built to carry 65 people, but Murdoch had not been able to convince passengers to leave the warmth and comfort of the ship. Neither Murdoch nor Lightoller, who was loading his first boat on the port side, was worried about launching nearly empty lifeboats. There would be plenty of time to bring them back to the ship to pick up more passengers, and they could load the boats much more easily through boarding hatches on the lower decks. The lifeboats would be most useful for ferrying people to the rescue ships when they arrived in a few hours. In the half hour after the first lifeboat was away, Murdoch and Lowe on the starboard side and Lightoller and Wild on the port side launched five more boats, all of them carrying only first-class passengers and crew. One third-class passenger, an Italian immigrant with a broken arm named Philip Zeni, managed to get aboard the sixth boat as it went down the side of the ship. As though cued by some primitive instinct, the mood on the ship changed. A wave of second and third class passengers erupted onto the upper decks. Even to a person who had never been aboard a ship, the steadily increasing angle of the deck and the water rushing through companionways in the first four compartments signaled danger. The passengers and crew who had been in the flooding men's compartments on the lower decks in the bow were in full flight. In the women's and families' compartments in the stern, the danger was not so obvious at first. On the way up from her quarters, Violet Jessup passed crewmen chatting and smoking on the stairs as if nothing was happening. On deck, she reported to Lightoller and tried to give up her seat in boat number 16. He ordered her aboard. As Jessup squeezed in with Elizabeth Leather at her side, someone handed her a swaddled infant. For the first time, she believed Titanic would sink. Far below the boat deck, most third-class passengers were staying in their staterooms because they did not speak the language of the sea. They did not understand that something terrible had happened to their ship. If they'd woken when Titanic hit the iceberg, most of them went right back to sleep. Changes in the sound of the engines meant nothing to them. By the time the first of them, including Olaus Abelseth, Adolf Humblin, Karen Abelseth, and Anna Saltscheltsvik, reached the open air at the stern of B-deck, the calm pace of loading the first lifeboats had deteriorated into a riot. Abelseth pulled Karen and Anna up the boat deck stairway, where two seamen were screening out men and allowing only women near the boats. Just as Karen and Anna went through the barrier, one of the seamen yelled, Everybody! Abelseth and Humblin went up too. Abelseth lost track of Anna, but he saw an officer grab Karen and throw her into a lifeboat. Another officer shouted, Are there any sailors here? Are there any sailors here? Abelseth had fished with his father in Norway from the time he was 10 years old until he'd left for America. He knew how to handle a small boat as well as any man on Titanic, but his cousins were nowhere to be seen. He couldn't bear the thought of surviving if they did not. He said nothing to the officer and fought his way back into the crowd to look for them. Red distress rockets exploded over the ship, their light blotting out the stars for the few minutes it took for them to burn out. All 16 wooden lifeboats had been launched. At the front of the boat deck, Wilde began preparing the first of the four collapsible lifeboats. They had wooden bottoms with canvas sides, and could carry only 40 people each. Bruce Ismay, still in his pajamas and overcoat, ran up to lend a hand with the launching of the collapsible boats. In minutes, they fastened the first one to a davit. Wild crammed 50 people into it, then turned to Ismay. There are no more women and children nearby, Wild said. Get in the boat. Ismay obeyed and left Titanic. Wild and Lightoller wrestled with the last two collapsible boats, trying to move them under the davits. A crowd surged around them. Titanic shuddered in an entirely new, much more frightening way. The ship seemed to inhale, then exhale as though it were taking deep breaths. 
The noise was deafening, a combination of a high-pitched whine and a deep groaning note that no one had ever heard before. In her lifeboat, some 200 yards from the roaring ship, Violet Jessup held the infant who had materialized in her arms. She didn't know whether it was a boy or girl. Jessup held the baby against her belly underneath her eiderdown coat, clucking to calm it, and heard the dreadful sounds of the ship's death throes above her. Surely this is all a dream, she muttered to no one. Olaus Abelseth's cousins were lost in the chaos. At the stern of the wildly trembling ship, he cinched on his white Kapok life jacket, took a deep breath, and jumped in the direction of a lifeboat below. Light Toller frantically tried to free the last collapsible lifeboat, which was wedged into its chocks on the roof of the deckhouse with its tie-down ropes snarled. Harold Bride was helping Light Toller. He had stayed at his telegraph key until Smith came to the Marconi room, relieved him of his post, and disappeared into the flooding wheelhouse. A hump of the sea washed over the deck below the top of the officer's quarters, jarring the last lifeboat free. It tumbled off the ship. Light Toller and Bride fell into the sea alongside it. The lifeboat swamped, then turned over. Underneath it, they flailed in the darkness, swallowing seawater and fighting off the arms of other terrified men. They clawed their way clear and climbed to the top of the overturned lifeboat, where they joined other men clinging to its keel. Bruce Ismay did not see the end. He was pulling hard on an oar in his lifeboat with his back toward Titanic. He turned around once as they rowed away from the side, saw the chaos at the rail, saw Thomas Andrews throwing deck chairs into the sea, saw people jumping, and looked away. Behind him, he heard the strains of Song d'Auton. An odd thought popped into his head. Number 114 in the White Star Music Book. Ismay rode some more. The sinister shrieks of tearing steel overwhelmed all other sounds. He heard cables snapping like rifle shots and risked another look. The forward funnel broke free of the deck, toppled absurdly into the sea, and swamped a lifeboat. For long minutes, Ismay could not force himself to turn around again. The next time he did, Titanic was gone. He hadn't felt even a ripple as the ship went down. The sounds in the endless darkness changed again. Ismay heard the voices of people in the water. He made out a few words. Come back, help, God, please. And he heard many words in languages that he did not understand. Ismay fell on his oar. His valet Richard Fry and his secretary William Harrison had stayed. They were out there. Smith, Andrews, the sailor in charge of the lifeboat, hollered at him to row. Ismay rowed. A half hour later, the words, screams, and whimpers stopped as though a switch had been thrown. Carpathia was an hour and ten minutes away.